Good morning. I'm Matt Smith, president of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to the first, first Friday of our 2021 series. Um, for those of you who are um, just joining us for the first time, our first Friday um, speaker series is a monthly policy and political discussion series that the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber, which is an affiliate of the Allegheny Conference, hosts for our members. And it's really a way for us to connect all of you to the critical policymakers on the local, state, and federal level um, who, who we know are going to shape our future economic growth um, and our equity issues and our quality of life issues. And so we really value the opportunity to directly connect all of you and engage you in, in these discussions with critical policymakers. And it's really a way for us to make sure that we're not only getting information out to all of you in a very timely and efficient and effective manner, uh, but that we're in the room and at the table, um, as it were, to really shape the public policies moving forward, as I said, that, that we know will go directly towards uh, equity issues in our region, the economic growth issues in our region, and our quality of life issues in this region. So today we're very happy to have uh, Senator Jay Costa with us, um, uh, to joining us for this first First Friday. But before I inter, uh, introduce Jay, uh, Senator Costa, uh, I want to make sure that I thank um, our sponsor for our 2021 uh, First Friday speaker series, uh, Comcast. Um, and, and we are not able to do events like this, bring, bring the policymakers to all of you without the generous support um, of our members. And in this case, Comcast really stepped up um, in a significant manner um, to sponsor the full year and, and allow us to host this series and bring you this critical information. Um, so without further ado, I am going to introduce uh, Lisa Nolan Birmingham, who is Comcast VP of External and Government Affairs um, for a brief um, segment on Comcast. And then Lisa will kick it back to me and I'll introduce Senator Costa. Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone. I'm privileged to precede Senator Costa on this very first First Friday. I look forward to his remarks. We're very pleased to sponsor First Fridays and we appreciate the leadership of the chamber and the conference, especially during this challenging time. This morning, I wanna share the role Comcast has played and will continue to play advancing digital equity and broadband in our region. As some of you probably know, um, in the conference's recovery plan, broadband like roads and bridges is now considered critical infrastructure. And for good reason, in our digital economy, Connecting people to the internet and digital skills is connecting them to opportunity. When the pandemic hit last March, we opened up all our Wi-Fi hotspots, thousands here in the Pittsburgh region to the public and they are still open. We offered two free months of internet essentials, our affordable home internet and laptop program to new low income households. We partnered with the school districts and organizations like Pittsburgh Public and Neighborhood Allies to fund home internet services for students in need. And as part of a larger diversity, equity and inclusion initiative, we launched RISE. Through Comcast Business and Effective TV, RISE provides technology upgrades and digital marketing services to black owned businesses and businesses owned by people of color, women and other historically disadvantaged groups. We've awarded over 700 grants across the country and eight to Pittsburgh entrepreneurs. And we hope many of you listening will share this program and apply for RISE grants. And finally, we responded to demand in our rural areas in 2020. In fact, we built over 350 new miles to serve several hundred Pennsylvania homes. And we're currently working with several counties in Pennsylvania and West Virginia to bring broadband to more rural areas. I wanna emphasize that these are not just COVID efforts. We've been addressing digital equity in rural and urban areas for more than 20 years. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Internet Essentials, um, we just announced uh, in the last few weeks, speed increases for all of our customers. And we introduced our newest digital equity initiative, Lift Zones. Lift Zones provide free gigabit Wi-Fi and digital literacy support 
in safe supervised spaces in our neighborhoods. Our goal in the next year is to activate more than a thousand lift zones nationwide. We've already launched eight of these in Pittsburgh. We're working with the Housing Authority, Gwen's Girls, Boys and Girls Clubs, and we're actively looking for more sites. So if you know of a neighborhood in need, contact me. We'd love to get more people connected. So before I turn it back to Matt, I'd like to share a video clip to inspire all of us to keep our region connected to the internet and to opportunity. So thanks for your time this morning. Back to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Lisa. And, and I know on my end, I was having audio trouble with the mm -hmm. clip. So I will make sure that our team um, sends out the, the video clip, uh, if that was the case for everyone, um, to, the, to the full audience uh, here today. So, so apologies on the audio with, with that video clip. Um, so I, I will take it from here. Um, and you know, very happy, as I said, uh, to introduce Senator Costa um, here today. Jake, Senator Costa has been um, the Senate Democratic leader since 2010. And for me personally, when I was in the, the state Senate in Jay's caucus, um, was a personal mentor to me. And don't know if he would take uh, credit or accept that today, um, but, but he was um, just a tremendous mentor, uh, taught me a ton about uh, the way the Senate works and, and just provided really invaluable life lessons to me. So on a personal level, I've always appreciated Senator Costa's influence, not only on our region, but, but on me personally. Um, Senator Costa, you know, we, we thought was a perfect speaker to kick off our series because he is really at the center of so much that is going on now that impacts uh, our economy, our, our region's equity, our quality of life um, on a whole host of issues from transportation and infrastructure to economic development issues. Um, to COVID relief. Um, and just this week, um, and I think uh, it either was yesterday or, or it's going to happen today, um, Senate Bill 109, uh, which is a really significant um, COVID relief package that directs some of the federal money uh, that was provided to the state out into the community, um, was, um, is gonna move from the Senate over to the House. And, and Senator Costa was really integral in that legislation particularly from our perspective, something that was vital, the $145 million um, hospitality industry grant program uh, that is going to provide significant relief. Um, I believe the, the um, numbers for businesses that are 300 employees or fewer, and it's going to be driven out through our certified economic development organizations in the region and our CDFIs. Um, and so you know, look for more information from us um, on how to plug into those grants because there's going to be, um, an ur there's, a, there's an urgent need for it right now, but there's going to be um, a critical need to, to move very quickly. So if you are um, one of those potential recipients, um, you know, we can provide you with that information or um, acquire that information on your own because it will be critical uh, to have all of your ducks in a row and your information ready and, and the ability to apply for those uh, grants very quickly. So I wanted to specifically flag that item because it is critical and it's something that we've long supported and we appreciate Senator Costa's support and his work on that issue as well. So without further ado, uh, I will bring uh, Senator Costa uh, up to the, to the uh, panel, so to speak. Uh, but again, very happy to have you with us today, Senator Costa. And without further ado, please take it away. Well, thank you very much, President Smith. Can everybody hear me okay? I guess so. Thank you very much, um, Matt, for having me today. Um, really appreciate the chance to be with all of you. Thank you and the chamber and the conference for conducting these forums. And and really want to say, Lisa, thank you and Comcast for the work, you know, the support for these discussions. 
because I think that they're very valuable and they're important to helping you know, lawmakers like me and policymakers really develop and, uh, and foster the appropriate solutions to some of the issues that we're dealing with in, in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County and across Pennsylvania. And, and your voice, your collective voices in this conversation through your folks you work with in Harrisburg and we work with in, in, in the city as well is really helpful to all of us to help, like I said, you know, frame the issues and garner support and build the grassroots level support that's necessary on a lot of issues. So we're really pleased um, that we're doing this and I'm happy to be with you. And I see a lot of friends who we've worked with over the years uh, who are part of the call uh, today as well. You have to excuse me, I'm calling from uh, the Turnpike. Uh, as Matt said, uh, today we were called back into session about 3.30 yesterday to come back today uh, to work on Senate Bill 109. And I'll jump into that uh, in a few minutes, but I think that is a pretty important piece of legislation. Uh, it's expected today to pass the House um, at some point today. I think they're going in at 9.30. We expect to get it around noontime and uh, we will concur in their changes and, and get it to the governor's desk. Um, but I wanna just start off, I think, by talking a little bit about uh, where things are in, in Harrisburg. And as you know, this is the first week or so in February and this is budget season. And after a couple, a little bit of a delay, we finally got the governor's budget address after he even drifted out a little bit. Uh, he finally gave his budget address and it was a little different budget address than I think we've seen in the last couple of years uh, with respect to the bold nature of this, his proposals and, and his goals that he has set for us to be able to try to address. The most significant part of that conversation is uh, really in two areas, in my view. One is the governor wants to finally address the issue with respect to fair funding across Pennsylvania for our school districts and achieves that, but also recognizing that uh, there are many school districts like Pittsburgh, for example, that under that formula uh, would be impacted negatively. So we have to take steps to be able to hold folks harmless going forward. Otherwise, it would be a major, certainly reduction in Pittsburgh and some of our other school districts, and that's being addressed. The other big part of what he's trying to achieve is for us to really get our arms around the structural deficit that, we've, that we just keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, what he does with that uh, is the way he goes about doing that is proposing a personal income tax increase from 3.07 to 4.49. And we'll discuss that as well because that's only half of the story. But at the end of the day, um, the major issue in the governor's budget are, are, are those two things. For the most part, the remaining part of the budget is a somewhat status quo, maybe a couple increases and in a few other line items and the like uh, that, need to be, um, that we need some help on. Uh, there are monies that are gonna make their way to our health departments at the county and municipal levels to provide them needed support through the um, COVID relief efforts that they've undertaken and done very well as a, from my viewpoint to try to assist them along to those lines. Uh, there's some other programs in, um, with respect to our state system of higher education. Uh, the governor's again proposing what's called the Nellie Bly uh, Scholarship Fund and it would be, and that scholarship fund would essentially provide free tuition to students from Pennsylvania who attend the state system schools. Uh, IUP, Clarion, Edinburgh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the proceeds from that would come from what's known as the uh, horse racing fund, uh, which was something that you may remember. And uh, we, it was a covenant we had with the uh, horsemen's groups across Pennsylvania when we initially uh, passed the legislation for gaming in Pennsylvania. At that time, it was only the slot machines. And as you now know, it, it's, it's grown, we've expanded it considerably over the years. But in the education space, as I mentioned, the governor's proposing that we provide three, close to $3 billion in education spending, additional spending. Uh, a lot of that, as I mentioned, is to implement the full amount of our education spending through the funding formula. What we've done over the past number of years, the last four or five years is when we initially adopted the fair funding formula, we only applied it to the new dollars that were being spent in education. So last year, for example, when we increased um, basic get funding by a couple hundred million dollars, whatever given year it was, it would only that only that 200 would go out under that formula. The remainder would go out, the remaining 5 billion or so would go out under the existing formula. Um, this changes that. This would take all the existing dollars plus some and put it into the, um, under the fair funding formula. At the end of the day, you have school districts that are winners and losers. And the losers would end, end up being made whole um, because the governor's taking about $1.15 billion from this new revenue stream and applying it to those school districts that would lose resources. For example, like the city of Pittsburgh and some other school districts in, in Western PA, mostly some of the um, uh, 
poor, economically struggling school districts, I would say, would be, in some instances, be losers. So we fixed that. We try to rectify that by doing a hold harmless provision. Now, school districts across Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, York, and Harrisburg, and Erie, and Scranton, uh, they end up becoming winners because the variables in the formula uh, are ones that I think apply to them favorably more so than they do to Pittsburgh and our, some of our schools. Those factors are, some, in some instances, growth. Uh, other instances is the modification of poverty level, things of that nature. But that's the big news in the education space that what the governor wants to do. Right now, there's no increase for higher ed. It's a little bit disappointing, but um, that, that's the part of it that I think we will negotiate as we go forward. I'm a strong advocate for helping um, you know, a higher ed community and in particular our community colleges and workforce training folks as well. So we'll work towards that end uh, as we go forward. Um, the, the PIT increase, uh, while it sounds alarming at first, it's a 46% increase. I think folks have to take that also knowing that there is going to be uh, another part of that. And that is what is known as the increase. We used to call it the poverty exemption. It's now I think called a special tax forgiveness program. And the special tax forgiveness program uh, would essentially more than double the uh, level as it was before for individuals. So right now, if you were an individual, um, you would get a $6,500 exemption. We're increasing that to $15,000. If you had one dependent and the number was 9,500, we're increasing that to 10,000. So at the end of the day, you would have someone, a family of four making $50,000, husband, wife, two kids, uh, you would have, um, you would pay no state income tax and it would rise up to, I believe, $84,000. Again, family of four, you know, two parents, two kids making $84,000 would make, I believe it's about, we'll have to pay maybe $11 more under that scenario. And I think that's what I think folks are not grasping when you talk about the PIT increase. In fact, 40% of the people who today file in state income tax return would pay less. And the break even point, I believe, is 67% of the people who file income tax returns would pay either would pay less. 33% would pay more. The upper echelon incomes would pay more in Pennsylvania. Uh, that, so this, this is really the beginning uh, in, our, in the governor's effort to try to create a progressive tax here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we believe that it, it will uh, withstand constitutional muster, but uh, time will tell whether or not if anybody files lawsuits against that. Now, I would say to you, um, folks right away, think about small businesses being impacted who file the, C, you know, who file the Schedule C and, and get the, you know, uh, have to pay at that rate as well. Uh, the things I just mentioned to you all continue to apply to those small businesses that would file what I'm told is a Schedule C um, to allow them to avail themselves to the same type of thing. So if you have a small business making 70, I think it's you know, 84,000 or whatever the number might be, I can't recall off the top of my head, they would be able to continue to get these benefits as well and see the reduction as well. We'll continue to pay essentially at the 3.07 rate in terms of dollar wise. Uh, so that's the most significant piece in, in that budget, uh, those two parts of it. Um, you know, Matt talked a little bit about Senate Bill 109 and, and I'm on my way to Harrisburg, as I mentioned, for us to pass that. Uh, that's legislation that helps us drive out the CARES money that came to us uh, sometime in December. There are portions of the CARES dollars that came to us that uh, the governor had discretion over which to, to spend. Uh, for example, the $2.2 billion that he put out into the school districts recently. You may recall, you, you may have seen a couple weeks ago that every school district in Pennsylvania received a, a sum uh, from the governor's office based on the formula that, that, that was required to be utilized. So the $2.2 billion went out under the governor's jurisdiction or authority. And that was because it was formula driven based upon the federal law. The money we're driving out um, is not based on, it's not based on um, formula driven nature. It, it's, it's sort of discretionary, but the legislature has to do that. Uh, when we did the budget last year, the governor uh, agreed to say that any non-formula money would essentially, from the CARES money would need to go through uh, the legislature, and that's that's where we're at. So uh, what do we have in Senate Bill 109? The biggest component is the piece regarding uh, rental relief, which is enormously important and something Senate Democrats have been fighting for and, and hope, you know, we tried to fix the hundred plus million dollars we couldn't get out last time. 
we've made changes to the program. We're working closely with our counties. Uh, we're working closely with uh, our, our community providers who are in this health housing space to assist us. Uh, Action Housing has been a big player in this space, helping us, Larry Swanson and his group. And we're working very hard to accommodate them as well as legal services, uh, Bob Racunas and Neighborhood Legal Services and Legal Aid all around Pennsylvania uh, to drive these dollars out. There's 800 plus, I think it's $847 million came to us in this rental assistance space. We are driving out, um, part of it went directly to the city and the counties. Any municipality over 200,000 uh, received their own allocation out of the 847. So Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, I think received in total combined, I think it was $36 million. Um, and they're implementing their own program. I think city council and county council or, or County Executive Fitzgerald are working together to develop that program. Um, then, so they, they have the 36th and they have their program going. At the state level, we're driving out about 800, or excuse me, 400 or 500 and some million dollars we're driving out. For Allegheny County, it's an additional $44 million. Uh, those dollars will be driven out through the Department of, Department of Health and Human Services at the state. And they will then work in conjunction with a statewide program. There are, I think, 18 counties that qualify for their own funding. So they have their own program. The other 49 counties will only have the one pot coming to them. And that is a pot that is um, the state state share, which will work through DHS. And the goal is to try to not have multiple rental assistance and utility assistance programs going forward. But the county and the city are adopting one. And then the state will adopt one in conjunction with those with the county and cities across Pennsylvania and, and implement those programs. So we sort of have as best we can a seamless rental assistance, utility assistance program for folks to avail themselves to. Uh, that's important because we have to get these dollars out. We know many folks are hurting and it's done in conjunction with not only the renters, obviously, but the landlords are part of that as well. And they need to sign off on, on the program uh, on the applicants um, applications for that as well. So that's one part of 109. The other significant part is something as Matt mentioned, we've been advocating for quite a long time and those proceeds for uh, folks in our hospitality community. And uh, we feel that we're, we've had some success in that space in the past, and uh, we will continue to push for that as well. Um, you may remember when we did the CARES package back in June of last year, we Senate Democrats argued and we were successful in getting $225 million to, um, to the small business community. Uh, we did a program through the CDFIs, we worked in conjunction with DCED, we did about $225 million, went out to small uh, small businesses, uh, businesses, quite frankly, that were unfortunately missed out on the PPP and didn't essentially have the correct relationships to be able to you know, benefit from that. So we noticed that. And we also put $100 million of that into small uh, and disadvantaged uh, communities that had small businesses there. Uh, we, we carved out $100 million for them as well. Uh, this program sort of builds on that. It's a little more narrow, though. Instead of being small businesses, which we did last time. And, and by the way, about 30% of them were small business were restaurant bars and taverns in that grouping. Um, the $145 million is limited to the hospitality community, bars, restaurants, taverns, and hotels essentially. And this, this $145 million is a transfer from the Workman's Compensation Trust Fund. It's a loan, we gotta pay it back. And we will, whether it be from CARES money or whether it be um, state revenue to pay it back. Um, that's what we have in front of us now. So this program will be up and running once the governor signs the bill. It will um, go through both the CDFIs, as Matt mentioned, and the CDO, CDOs as well. So there'll be, and there, through the CDFIs, and we have good ones there, and some of them are, are serving both, both spending and it's up and running. In fact, what we might be doing is looking at some of the small businesses that we're not able to collect from the previous program, sort of make those folks who were uh, declined because we didn't have enough money, uh, put those sort of folks first in line so that we can help them because they've demonstrated a need. It just wasn't the money there. By the way, those those grants that we passed out before were in the range of like eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars per recipient. In this case, these grants will be in five thousand dollar increments and capping out at fifty thousand dollars. But we think it's a really good um, it's a really good piece of um, a really good program that we've been advocating for a while and, and applaud the governor and working with us and certainly our Republican colleagues in that regard. Now, there was something added to something else that our folks have been pushing for regarding the PPP and as it relates to filing your income tax returns. Um, many institutions and entities receive the PPP. 
money from the federal government. And my colleague, Jim Brewster, was of the mindset that any, any entity, folks are any, receiving any money through the, through the federal government along those lines, through the CARES Board, and that money should be um, exempt from, from state taxation. And so we were successful in working and pushing to get that in. Um, but the other part of it is, is another major, um, less talked about benefit of this legislation. And that is a $220 million, what I'll call a uh, tax exemption for small businesses collectively. Small businesses who receive the PPP will not only have to, won't have to claim it as income, but in addition to that, they'll be able to claim it as a deduction uh, on, their, on their tax returns, as, as I'm being told, as, as logistically how it works out. The Department of Revenue tells us it's about a $220 million impact to the Commonwealth of lost revenue, but as I mentioned, potentially a $220 million um, reduction in, in taxes that will need to be paid by small businesses. So I think uh, that's something that's very beneficial as well. And the last part of Senate Bill 109 deals with some educational dollars that can need to go out. There is, um, Governor again has, as I mentioned, some education dollars and the CARES money that are from, that are the discretionary. It's about $150 million in one segment and 47 million in another pot. He's, we're gonna put those out to uh, what are called non-public schools. So all those entities that are non-public schools will have a program through PDE a Department of Ed that will provide for a grant program uh, to non-public entities to be able to receive some resources. And then finally, there's another 47 million we're driving out, uh, some to um, career and technical education, I think is gonna get about 18 million. Uh, our approved private schools and our four charter schools for deaf and blind will get shared by nine or 10 million. Um, and I think there's another, one other part, oh, community colleges now will be getting um, I think $14 million of which as I shared with Dr. Bowley today, we'll get about $2 million for Allegheny County for our community college, which we're putting to good use. And, and we're really impacting, by the way, just as a plug to the college, uh, putting a lot of money out in to help our students uh, with tuition and, and, and being able to afford uh, coming to class. And it's uh, really applaud the work that our administration's doing there. So um, that's a summary of Senate Bill 109. The last thing I, may want, I want to talk about briefly is you may have been reading about this issue regarding the two-year uh, statute of limitation window that allows individuals who, as child, uh, children under the age of 18, were abused and their claim against their abuser or entities uh, was time barred. Uh, there's a number of folks across the Commonwealth that that occurred with. Um, we have now, and we were proceeding, we had tried to do legislation to permit that to happen. There are some folks who raised it as a constitutional issue, uh, that would have constitutional issues, and therefore we were uh, in a position not to, you know, couldn't do it legislatively, had to do a constitutional amendment. We thought we started down that path back in, the, in, in early in, in 2019. As it turned out, we did pass the first leg of a constitutional amendment process. As it turned out, as we learned this week, uh, the Secretary of State failed to, um, failed to properly and timely advertise the passage of that in the first session. As a result, it, it's as if it never happened. So we sort of had to start all over again. There's a provision in the Constitution that allows for what are recalled special or emergency that the constitutional amendment process. And now it looks as if that's what we're going to do. We're going to avail ourselves to this rarely, if ever, used constitutional amendment process, uh, probably in the coming weeks, to be able to allow for uh, this measure to get on the ballot right away, as opposed to waiting two more years before we would have the second leg. Um, so that's going to be a discussion you'll hear about as we go forward. Uh, there's support for uh, certainly a constitutional amendment. We've been advocating for parallel paths that we do um, that we do a legislative path that we have our members of our members have introduced legislation there to allow this two year window. We have consensus from uh, the governor and, and the parties that it could work and um, and then also run the parallel path through the first leg of the constitutional amendment that get and then in two years if the constitution or if there's if the legislative relief is unconstitutional, we have the, the amendment process in the works to close that out. So it, it definitely in two years, we'll have the appropriate authority to do that. So that's kind of the issue that's working its way through the legislature now that's been uh, resulted, quite frankly, in, in, the, in the era of advertising resulted in our Secretary of State filing, uh, or I'm sorry, having to resign effective today, in fact. Um, so the last base is election law. Um, I know you have a lot of questions about that. So 
but I think I better shut up now and uh, maybe take some questions before I lose everybody. All right. You guys can everybody see me? I can't seem to see myself, but I assume I'm gonna jump in here, Senator. Thank you so much. All right, here we go. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I am Jen Beer, Vice President of Government Affairs with the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber. And Senator, thank you so much for joining us this morning um, for your longtime partnership and leadership um, and obviously dedication as you um, continue to join us as you're driving. So, so please be safe. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to take us through the Q&A. Um, we have a lot coming through, so I will jump right in. Just a final quick reminder to everybody who's joining us, please feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom if you have a question for the senator, and I will do my best to get to a variety of issues. So let's kick it off. Um, senator, I know you touched on the governor's budget address, and you talked a lot about the PIT but we also know that there were some changes to the CNI. Uh, there was also a severance tax mentioned. Can you just talk through if, if you know any priority um, level or of, of any of these changes, whether for your caucus, for the governor, or maybe comment a little bit on um, the political will that you think will be needed to move one or any of these in particular? Uh, yeah, Jen, you're correct. Uh, governor proposed again that we do, you know, um, close the loophole and, and do combined reporting and over the course of I think four years or so get us down to I think it's 5.99. Uh, it, it, this is an annual request and uh, I don't I can't speak to whether or not there is a strong consensus along those lines. And similarly the governor has recommended I think he may have called it something different this time uh, but looking for essentially a Marcellus shell extraction tax um, to be perfectly blunt uh, I don't think either one of them have much of a chance moving forward, unless we get a serious engagement uh, on the, uh, with, with, certainly with the, with the chamber and the, and the conferences across the region to address the, um, the combined reporting conversation. But as of right now, um, it's not one that I think is gonna garner a lot of steam at this point. I just, that, that's, my, that's my take. Okay, thank you. There were a lot of questions coming through around local governments and DCED, and we were gonna ask you about this as well. So I'll sort of try to maybe lump, lump a few of these together, but um, obviously, you know, the conference chamber, um, we work closely with our local governments. We've been very, um, you know, concerned about how they're doing, especially through COVID. Um, clearly DCED is, is one of their biggest champions and we saw that line item um, decreased a lot. Um, you know, ensuring that that department is fully funded um, is, is very important obviously to us, but to a lot of our communities. You've been especially um, uh, supportive and great on um, the NAP tax credit, for example, um, but clearly we wanna make sure that um, all of the programs there are supported. Any sort of feelings from your end on, on DCED and the line items there? Yeah, um, you know, Jen, this is sort of, again, part of the ritual that we go through in Harrisburg, um, dealing with the governor's proposed budget uh, in terms of he, how he sets his priorities um, and it manifested in the line item numbers. Um, there are a number of lines that uh, what we call uh, legis legislative addbacks uh, that through the legislative negotiated process that we add back into these areas uh, because they are priorities of our members uh, recognizing the value particularly in DCED uh, the ability to drive dollars out to not only our local governments but our communities and the like and and specific programs that are important to people in, in, in our communities so uh, those line items will ultimately and for the most part be restored uh, it's just part of the process that we go forward and, and go how we deal with you know, with respect to the issue of local governments, and, and we share the concerns um, that uh, we have a lot of work to do in this space to be able to provide them assistance. We are really pushing hard our federal and congressional delegation. We're in conversation. I've been with Congressman Doyle multiple times in this space, as well as uh, Congress, Congressman Lamb and, uh, and then Senator Casey, of course, pushing to make sure that the um, the 1.9 trillion that they're working on, and if they modify it, if they don't modify the local and state share, I think it's 350 right now. 
uh, we need the state and local share from the federal government to really help us manage what needs to get done. Forgetting about the state share, the local share, they don't have the same degree of uh, ability to generate tax revenue as we do at the state level. So a lot of them are hurting. We all know about the Pittsburgh situation in terms of you know, what steps they'll need to take come January, July 1, I believe, with respect to their personnel. So it's imperative that we get those local dollars uh, out to local governments, as, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to assist them uh, in, in their governing in terms of how they govern or the municipal services that they provide at the county and, and, and city level. So we're pushing hard on that. And then, um, so that that's one of the things I did want to mention that I failed to talk about. That's going to be a critical play um, in the you know, budget process. Now, the governor's requests were, were very ambitious, as I said, and you know I can't sit here and tell you that either one of the two major items are going to be addressed. Uh, if we're successful at the federal level, if, let's say we get 200 of the 350 for states, our share is typically about 4% of that. So we would, could be looking anywhere from seven to $8 million to billion dollars coming to Pennsylvania, maybe a little bit less, depending upon how much is allocated to states. But, um, you know, my guess is that there may be uh, uh, an, an opportunity for others who aren't interested in the governor's proposal to really take that money and and manage Pennsylvania for the next couple of years using those dollars and then essentially kicking the can down the road for a while and, and dealing with the structural deficit, as I mentioned before, dealing with that at a later point in time. So if I had to guess, uh, this is just me speaking, but if I had to guess, uh, that's probably the path that we're going to go down in that regard, just getting whatever federal money we can and applying it to basically status quo for a little while and and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will wait till you know January 2023 to see if they have a governor of their party or, or whether it's a continuation of a democratic governor. So that's my personal um, sort of view of all this and we'll see how it plays out. Okay, thank you. And just so you know, we've been uh, very supportive and consistently weighing in with our congressional delegation oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and senators as well on additional funding for states and uh, and the uh, local governments. So thank you. Um, here is a question um, around the hospitality industry. Will the hospitality relief program from the state follow the federal PPP program employee limit rules that measure employee numbers in a per location basis versus total company employee level? So if you own more than one more than just a few restaurants, sorry, you likely wouldn't qualify under the current bill. Um, you know, I don't know a clear answer to that. I just know that it's 300 employees. My assumption it would be that I don't think, I don't believe we're going to follow the PPP guidelines. I think I have to go back and look at what we did with respect to um, the $225 million we already did um, because hospitality folks did enjoy some of that. My guess is that um, I didn't read, we did ours through the CDFIs and I think that they they will, the program working with the state will be able to do that. So I, I don't have a clear answer to that. Um, I expect that the guidelines, there will be some legislative support for that. Uh, I don't know whether the federal, legislative support for the regulations, I should say, in the, in the, in the statute. I don't know to what degree the federal government, when they gave us the CARES money, what restrictions they put on it with respect uh, let me take that back because that's the 145 from the Workers Trust Fund. So, no, this is separate money. For, this is state dollars. Then um, it will not a, not not necessarily be applicable to PPP program or the guidelines that were set forth there. It's the federal government that had restrictions on how we spend the the, the renters' money that we incorporated. We have to incorporate, but we also incorporate into our programs as well. So, the 145 I think would be strictly driven out by the state. But I will get an answer, Jen, as to whether or not it will follow the PPP lines or not. I hope not, and I expect not. Okay. All right. Thank you. A couple questions here on the Nellie Bly program. I'll try to sort of put into one. Um, but part of it is uh, in a repeat from last year, the governor called for the creation of the Nellie Bly tuition program that repurposed dollars from the Pennsylvania Horse Fund. What are the prospects for passage this year and any insight into why it's geared to PASHI students only? So as you said, community colleges and private colleges play an important role, 
um, to our students in our community as well. Um, the prospects, I think, are there may be some additional dollars that come from the Horseman Fund. I mean, we already take, I believe, in uh, it's around $50 million a year for other other agricultural services that, that, that we, I believe, we still use the Horseman's Fund for. Um, you know, there's a belief that the, uh, the deal that was cut when we did in 2004, when we did the gaming legislation, has been very lucrative to the Horseman's Fund. And, um, and that, um, you know, it's the money's there is available to be able to utilize for this purpose. I can't give you, I mean, I, I, it's a heavy lift, let me put it that way, because I think that there are still some members who were there, like myself and some others, um, that remember the, the covenant we made with the horse racing industry that this is an important part of how we were going to reestablish not only the, you know, the horse racing itself with improved pots, et cetera, but but the breeding and everything else that's associated with that, that puts that would move Pennsylvania to a place of prominence in that space. Uh, I think it's done that particularly as it relates to the wages of folks who work there and benefits and the like, it sort of forced those type of things to occur with the workers that had not been there before. Um, but the, the issue though now is that there are a significant number of members who probably weren't even born in 04. that don't remember that covenant and that conversation. And I think that's part of it as well. So that's what we have to deal with and face that we're losing members who remember that time that that was the, the goal and that was the promise. They've since moved on and they're newer people who have no recollection or, or, or interest and all they see is a, a pot of money for an industry that some folks don't necessarily believe is necessary. So uh, I still think though that the prospects are very, uh, it's a heavy lift. It's a, it's a big steep climb, I think, to implement that. That's my opinion. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Um, one issue that remains uh, at the top of our priority list, and I know our friends from the Port Authority are on, so I'd like to talk and ask you about transportation and infrastructure. The governor didn't mention um, anything in his budget, um, at least that I'm aware of, um, either talking about Act 89 and the, the transit payments that are sort of going to come to a head here in 2022. Um, but do you, how, how are you feeling about talks, um, including transportation, transit, all infrastructure projects, um, as we move forward with the budget discussion too? Do you, do you see um, this issue sort of? Jen, I would tell you I'm concerned. Okay. I'm sorry, I lost you there for a second. Am I okay still? Yeah, I can hear you. So I'm very concerned about that. You know, when we had our brief, well, I'm, I'm very concerned about that part of the conversation. We've not had much of one. Uh, we had a call to governor, I think on Monday night or Tuesday night, the leaders, and I raised it. I said, governor, because he was telling us what was gonna be in the budget. I said, you know, we're still absent. You know, we have a conversation, a $400 million problem we have to deal with, and we're not having that conversation. And if we're gonna talk about, you know, increasing revenue, whether it be through the PIT, whether it be through the extraction tax or whatever, that we have to incorporate a discussion about transit into this conversation in two parts. One is certainly the $40 million transfer issue we have to deal with that we're required to resolve by a year and a half or so from now, uh, but also the transfer from you know, the money we use to pay our state police across Pennsylvania and using it from the motor license fund. You know, everyone acknowledges we have challenges going forward. Uh, the fewer dollars are coming in, particularly now during the pandemic, People are traveling less and cars are more efficient and all those reasons that mean we're getting less money there. We have a plan to reduce our reliance upon the motor license fund to pay for the state police. However, I will tell you that, um, you know, we have to do more there. We have to continue to lower that number as best we can to, so we can make those investments in our roads and our bridges. So that um, that's an important conversation that has to take place. If it hasn't yet, we need to begin to work about it. And we, my view is, you know, the gas tax, I think, is something that we simply can't even deal with. That being said, I think Monday, I think I have a meeting uh, with the Secretary of Transportation to talk about the, the uh, program they're doing with respect to tolling bridges across Pennsylvania, the PPP program that they're putting into place, or the 3P program uh, with regard to tolling bridges and using those dollars to keep those dollars to maintain those, those bridges um, and also keep in, in, in excess dollars going forward would still stay in that respective district. So if we had to toll uh, a bridge in Pittsburgh, I'm just throwing this out. I'm not talking, I better not throw any bridges out. Anyhow, at the end of the day, if we tried to do that in let's say in Allegheny County, those dollars would maintain that bridge 
And then if it was in District 11 bridge, the excess dollars from the tolling uh, would continue. The tolling would continue beyond their dollars for repairs and the excess dollars would go into other types of infrastructure, um, roads and bridges in the District 11 area. Um, so that's moving forward. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that. And then I'm also, we're also gonna talk about really an important piece of that and making sure that we get our fair share uh, regarding the maintenance funding. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is driven by formula. And you know, as you know, you can tweak formulas and end up driving money out to different parts of the state and, and no one really knows. So uh, we have some issues there we're trying to deal with, uh, making sure that we get our requisite amount of maintenance funding for our roads and our bridges from PennDOT. Great. You know that you have uh, supportive friends here at the chamber, the conference, and uh, like I said, under the yep. port authority, the airport, we're all on board. Yeah, yeah uh, and the mass transit part of that, Jen, I'm sorry to interrupt you. The mass, Jen, the mass transit part obviously is the part of the 400 that we have to make sure that we yeah. preserve, um, you know, especially given our region and the nature of our workforce uh, in Pittsburgh in particular, uh, we have an obligation to be able to preserve that and we will. That's great. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, a priority for us, not only for business and commerce, but um, it's an it's an equity issue. So, yeah, it's definitely top of our priority list as well. Uh, changing directions a little bit, can you speak to any of the vaccine distribution issues? Yeah, I mean that that's a great question. I wanted to bring it up earlier, and I just forgot. Um, you know, we're struggling. There's no question. Uh, it's largely due to the, the number of vaccines we're receiving. I think as of two days ago, we're over 2 million vaccines received. Uh, we probably put about 1.2, 1.3 into arms. Um, we have to do a better job, quite frankly. Um, we, we've gone down a path where uh, the secretary, Levine, we agreed to do a, what I'll call a decentralized system, working with our healthcare providers and our pharmacies and community organizations and the like to drive out those dollars and uh, excuse me, drive out those vaccines. And you know, had we had sufficient supply, it wouldn't be the problem that we're facing. I think we saw yesterday, Allegheny County tried you know, the 750 vaccines that they had and the lines were overblown and um, in a matter of minutes or hour or so, the spots were all taken. Um, we we were, have been receiving 143,000 doses each week, which is about 20,000 a day for the whole state. We now, I think, are supposed to receive, based upon President Biden's increase, I think 166,000 uh, this upcoming week. Uh, and then the following week, we're told we should be getting 175,000. So that's welcome news. That's about 25% of or so where we were before an increase. Uh, that's a, certainly helped. Um, the issues has been, um, you know, so, so the vaccine numbers have been the issue. The secretary, the new secretary, Beam, Acting Secretary Allison Beam has been very forthcoming in terms of we have to make changes and is looking at other ways to be able to do the distribution. Uh, maybe possibly doing some interim mass distribution locations or maybe even you know, looking and considering other ways in which we can get people signed up, uh, particularly folks who don't have access to the internet. Um, some folks are using you know, phone numbers and the like and um, it's just crazy that you have pharmacies that have 15,000 people on a waiting list. And it's just, it's, it seems very disjointed um, right now. And I think we're trying to get our arms around that and I think we will. Um, so that's kind of where things are at in that space. I do think though, at the end of the day, as we get more vaccines in, we'll be able to distribute it. The network is in place to do well, provided we have the, what we have been sort of promised, as I mentioned back in, at the end of last year, you know, November, December timeline, we were told if not earlier, that um, you're gonna get X number of dosages. And that was the sort of the premise on why we went with this, what I'll call decentralized system, because I felt people felt the dosage would have been there to adequately administer the, the vaccine. Um, as we know, it turned out that, you know, it was like maybe, you know, 3% of what they promised folks in terms of the vaccine's availability. And we've been struggling ever since. So um, that's the reason I think we went down that path initially. Other states that have done better um, don't have sort of the nuances of what we have in Pennsylvania in terms of who we have in our 1A category, for example. So our 1A category is about uh, 4 million just in the 1A category. And as I mentioned, we've only received a little over 2 million, um, a few, you know, 2 million vaccines to be able to distribute. So um, 
we're trying to work to to resolve all that and looking at other options in terms of what we might be able to do. But I'm encouraged by uh, Acting Secretary Beam's willingness to take a fresh look at the distribution side. And I think the governor is, is looking to do that as well. And, and actually last night I received a call that um, the governor's looking at maybe putting together a task force of some sort to start looking at this. So we're gonna be talking about that later today. So that might be something that's coming to get our, you almost have like a more, a, a dedicated group of folks who are, who are really focused on the delivery side of this equation, particularly when we know that in the near future, we are gonna get more vaccines and we wanna ensure that we get them in the arms as quickly as possible. Thank you, thank you. Um, going back to economic development really quickly, a question um, specifically on business in our sites. Do you know if this program will be fully funded and operational in 2021 for qualifying infrastructure projects? Um, I don't know whether we're going to recapitalize that at all or not, or transfer any money within DCD or through CFA. I don't know at this point. I mean, it hasn't come up yet. I think it's something we should be looking to do. Um, I, I think we're out of money there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I, I will. That's a great point. I know we advocated for it a couple of years ago, but we replenished it. I can't. It was either 18, 19, or 19, 20. I can't remember. But that's a conversation. I think we you know, certainly warranted given where we are right now and what we want to try to do is get money into, into invest money into things along those lines. Senator, let me take one quick second away. I, I meant to mention this at the beginning. Um, we are, the chamber has come together with the city, the county and the URA um, to work together on regional joint economic development policy recommendations. So we look forward to working with you um, to share those, um, you know, in areas that we can coalesce around. So you're able to bring back to your other delegation members where um, this region is um, working together in the areas of economic development. Um, sorry to take that tangent, but I meant to mention that earlier. Is, uh, is yeah, something and, I, to just... and Jen, I know you guys uh, have provided us with information about some, some legislative changes and and some grams and, and, and again, bolstering up neighborhood assistance, for example, and some other changes with respect to land banks and all that stuff. So uh, we have all that information and, and the things that I think are logical. And, and you know, especially when we know that our sister county or uh, somewhat sister county in Philadelphia has some some um, mechanisms that, that they can, you know, tools they can utilize to be able to be more efficient in that space and expedite the process and, and make it easier for the land banks to be more successful than they have been. So we're aware of that and we'll work with you and others um, in, in, in that space. Great, great, great. Here's a question I think you did hit on. I think this might fall under, I think it's the 145 million that the governor um, proposed even before the budget, but I'll still ask you to, to be sure. Is there any funding specifically targeted for the support of minority owned businesses and black workers who have been so severely impacted during this time? So um, we did do that in the um, original two, the, the CARES Act piece we passed back in June, the $225 million I mentioned. It was specifically designed, 100 million of that was designed for uh, what I'll call businesses and, 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 and um, communities, uh, disadvantaged communities. And there's a very specific definition that defines what that means. Um, so we did do that there. The 145 will not be in this space. Um, because this is limited to the hospitality community, as I mentioned, but we did not carve out any for the disadvantaged communities, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, now, I would say, Jen, real quick, <clears throat> in our proposal, Senate Democrats, when we, you know, before we spent the money uh, before, uh, when we had the $1.3 billion left over that uh, we did not spend that ended up making its way back into the budget back in November. Uh, we again advocated for, I think, another $150 million for small and disadvantaged communities. And uh, we were unsuccessful in that regard because we didn't implement a plan. We didn't do a subsequent CARES piece. We end up driving those dollars and close the budget deficit. Right. <clears throat> um, on Senate Bill 109, will the grant funding be available for, will the grant funding available for non-public schools be open to private colleges and universities? Um, I don't know. I don't believe so, but I can double check on that, Jen. I'll get an answer today. I thought it was intended to be 
more K to 12. Okay. But I, I will check. I could be wrong. I have to go back and read that section because they, they, they amended the bill in the house and they moved some of those dollars around. But I know that uh, I'll double check on that. Okay. All right. And one here on liability reform. Um, I own and operate a national event planning and production company in Pittsburgh that has been idle since last March. I don't know if I will be required to make sure workers are vaccina vaccinated, how we will handle contact, contract workers and third party vendors, and what if any changes will be required in liability insurance. Also what the requirements will be for any data collection of attendee at events for contract tracing. Overall question, where does the state stand and what is the outlook on liability protection for small businesses and vaccination requirements? So I know this came up during last session and I think there was legislation that was passed. Uh, I think the governor may have vetoed it, I can't recall, <clears throat> but or if it made it home to his desk. Um, I, I think the question becomes, I think there's an appetite to work with folks in this space. However, what I'll say is that I think it's gotta be a reasonable accommodation and that was one of the concerns of the previous legislation that it, um, it, was, it was too too broad and too vague. And I think a lot of folks were concerned about that. And I think at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> I think something is much more narrowly tailored to folks, I think is what I think will probably garner a consensus to be able to get it home. But for right now, um, I don't know whether or not we'll be addressing that issue anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm just going to read this last, it's a comment that I 100% agree with, it's not a question, then I'll, I'll throw it back over to you, Senator, if you have any closing comments, but um, I definitely wanted to read this. It says, I am so appreciative of the breadth of Senator Costa's thoughtful awareness of so many critical issues. We are lucky to have him. So I totally agree and I wanted to read that. So um, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Do you wanna share any last few comments before we close? No, I didn't know my brother Paul was going to be in the meeting, so that's nice of him to say that. I'm just kidding. Oh. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and accommodating me, allowing me to do it this way. Um, you know, it, it made my travel to Harrisburg today. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. It's cold, but nevertheless, uh, it made the drive to Harrisburg much nicer and uh, happy to answer questions that folks have. And, you know, I really continue. I look forward to continuing working, uh, Jen, with you and Matt and your whole team and Larry and everybody. And, um, you know, you guys do great work and, and our partnership, and I call it a partnership because we rely upon each other to work together uh, on behalf of all your the clients that you have as part of the chamber and conference. So, you know, we're here to work with you and we want to continue to do that. And if your folks have any other late questions in that like in that regard, you know, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to get some answers for you or provide assistance any way we can. So thank all of you very, very much. Thank you. Um, well, on behalf of the Pittsburgh Chamber and our first Friday sponsor, Comcast Business, I want to give a big thank you again to Senator Costa for joining us, um, as well as your continued partnership and leadership in Harrisburg that we so appreciate. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, apologies if we didn't get to your question. Please send them over, and we will still try to get to respond to you as, um, as we can. Um, it's great to be back with our first Friday programs, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. So thank you and have a great day.